Chapter 32. Alton Holds His Hand. It was very quiet and somewhat chilly in the little back room of Horton's hotel when Dammer, who lay on a trestle cot, moved his head a trifle and made a feeble sign. The fire had sunk in the stove, and it was then towards two o'clock in the morning, when, men's, when man's vitality is at its lowest. The young Dr. Horton had brought in from a distant settlement shivered a little as he rose and stooped over the bed. Dammer glanced at him out of glazing eyes and made a faint gesture. I have no use for you, he said. It's Alton I want. The doctor crossed over to Horton, who sat in a corner. If there's anything you want to ask him, lose no time, he said. That The man can't last until morning. Well, Horton said gravely, it would be a favor if you went down for Nielsen, the surveyor. He's sitting up waiting. You see, we want some witnesses not connected with the thing in case he's going to tell us anything. Harry, you had better talk to him. Alton crossed the room and sat down by the bed. He had, as it happened, come out almost scatheless from the fall into the ravine, which was not the case with his assailant, who had been carried down to the settlement with the life just clinging to his crushed body. All that was possible had been done for him, and now Alton waited with intense suspense, with something akin to compassion in his eyes, and his anger diverted from the dying wretch to the man who had made use of him. If you're going to talk, he said, well, it's only square to warn you that it will all be put down. Dammer glanced at Horton, who sat with a pen in his hand and a paper at his knee, and from him to the surveyor holding one or two government appointments, who came quietly in. That's all right, he said slowly. Well, I wanted to kill you, but I don't know that I've got a great deal against you now. You and the boys did what you could for me, and it was a man in the city who held me to it. Oh, yes, he's sitting down there raking in the dollars. I don't care two cents that a man he sent up to make them is dying here. The thing's not square, anyway. Alton was sensible of a faint disgust, but he remembered that he could not afford to be fastidious, because the man he had drawn into his venture must stand or fall with him. We want to know who he is, he said. There was a glimmer of malice in Dammer's face. Well, he said, and the strained voice grew clear. It was Hallam of the Tai. There was something I did that that gave him a pull on me, and that man has no mercy for anybody. Alton heard the scratching of Horton's pen. And Hallam hired you to murder me? Yes, and Dammer glanced at Horton. You've got that down? At first he only hired me to go up to Samasco and watch you while I work for you. You're a tolerably smart man, Harry Alton, but it's a kind of curiosity. Curious you didn't know me. Alton stared at the drawn face with a bewildered expression, and then moved a trifle in his chair. Good Lord, he said. Black Nailer's partner. Well, I didn't see you that often, and it was dark when... Dahmer's face went awry with, awry with pain, but his gesture implied comprehension. Yes, he said feebly, when you got, got him with the axe. Naylor had been on the whiskey, and the gun of his was a little stiff on the magazine spring. But he was the best partner I'd ever had, and I left a good claim behind when you and the boys chased me right out of that part of Washington. Now you've got the beginning. Give me a little bit more brandy. The doctor came forward softly and held a glass to the cracked lips, and then lifted the dying man a little. After that, there was a silence for at least five minutes, and Alton sat rigidly still, clo rigidly still, choking down his fierce impatience as he saw his last hope sliding away from him. Then he drew in his breath with a qu quivering sigh as the feeble voice commenced again. Get it down. You haven't much time. Horton's pen scratched and spluttered, as sinking now and then almost beyond hearing. The disjointed words fell from the lips that could scarcely frame them. But it was nevertheless with a horrible vividness that Dahmer told his story, and those who sat listening gasped with relief when it was at last finished and everything was plain. Then he signed to the doctor, who raised his head a trifle, and once more held a glass to his lips. Read it. I want to see you've got it straight, he said. For a space, Horton's voice rose and fell monotonously, at monotonously as he read in haste. Then he approached the bed with the paper, and the dying man seized the pen. He traced a few straggling characters upon the document, and let it fall again, watched with strained impatience while Horton and the surveyor signed, then turned his head from the light. Now, he said, I guess I fixed the man who held the whip over me quite right, quite tight.
It was probably ten minutes before he moved again, and then he signed to Alton very feebly with his fingers, while a curious look that afterwards puzzled the rancher, who could not forget it, crept into his eyes. There was a vindictiveness in it, but whether there was more than that this, he could never tell. There's just another thing, he said in a hoarse, strained whisper as Alton bent over him. Come nearer, a little nearer still. Now there was another man as well as Hallam. Alton glanced round and saw that the others had not heard, and stooped a trifle further as the crack lips moved again. Nobody caught what Dahmer told him, but when he straightened himself again, his face was white and grim, and he went out without a word to anyone. Then a flicker of a smile came into the eyes of the dying man, and he moved his head so that his face was hidden. The doctor, crossing over softly, looked down on him and signed to the others that they might leave the room. He may last an hour or two, but I don't think he will speak again. In the meanwhile, Alton strode with his hands clenched into the shadows of the silent, uh, into the shadows of the silent pines. He had long been troubled by a vague suspicion and had driven them away. But he could not doubt what Dahmer had told him, and he groaned as he stood face to face with the ver verity. He had been too proud to stoop at any time to take an unfair advantage of an enemy, but he could not lightly forget a wrong, and there was a trace of stubborn vindictiveness within him. Hallam had brought him down to ruin, and thrice struck at his life by treachery, and now Dahmer's testimony had placed his enemy in his hand. But he had but to close it and crush him. But he also realized with a fierce anger what this would cost him, for Hallam had, it seemed, protected himself effectively. If he dragged Hallam down, Derringham must fall with him. And while that consideration alone would not have stayed him, in spite of the curious pride of race and family which he had become sensible of of late, it was evident that his daughter must suffer too. She had done no wrong, and Alton, who though who thought of her with great tenderness, dared not to contemplate all that the revelation would cost her. It would have been bitter to let his enemy go free had he stood there, stood alone. But that was, he realized, what no man could do. And there was behind him, with their future linked to his, the rancher Samasco, whose safety demanded that he should put it out of Hallam's power to do them a further injury. It would also be so simple. But he had to hold his hand, and Horton would take all the action that was needful. Then it became more plain to him that even at the cost of his loyalty to his comrades, he could not allow the woman he loved to suffer with a guilty. He knew her pride and that the blow would crush her, but again, through all his pity for her, a gust of rage shook him, and he groaned, he ground the soft sweeter he ground the soft cedar twigs viciously beneath his heel. He could not face the thought of the woman's humiliation. Everything must go, his pride, his faith, his vengeance, before that came about, and he stopped in his restless pacing and leaned against Pine as the conflicting emotions gave place to a quiet resolution. At last he could see the stars between the great branches high above him, and shivered as a, shivered a little as a chilly breeze sighed across the silent bush. Something in its stillness react, reacted upon him, and the last trace of his passion melted away. If he did wrong, he alone would be responsible, and at least his enemy's daughter should not suffer. Walking very slowly, he went back to the hotel and found Horton writing. He glanced at Alton curiously, and then answered the unasked, unasked question. Yes, he said. He's out on the trail now, and one would kind of wonder where it was taking him. Where have you been all this time, Harry? How long have I been? Asked said Hal Alton. Two hours, anyways. Well, you needn't tell me if you don't want to, but it's quite easy to see that something is worrying you. Alton concealed his astonishment. I've had things to think about, he said he. Weren't there a paper you took from Dahmer? Oh, yes, said Horton, flung him, and Horton flung him several crumpled sheets across. Nothing much to be made of that. It has been given to him to send to the ship it's been given it has been given him to send cipher telegrams with alton glanced at the paper with apparently vague curiosity but his brain was busy and he had a good memory i think i'd let the folks in vancouver have it he said with a yawn now i want a few hours rest because we're going back at sunup to restake the claim horton looked thoughtful i'm not quite sure you could hold it it hasn't been declared open 
Alton laughed a little. Well, I think I can, he said. Dahmer hasn't got, hasn't got his patent anyways, and it's scarcely likely that the man who sent him will protest against me. Then he slowly strolled away, but once the door closed behind him, <laughs> moved... Then he slowed, slowly strolled away, but once the door closed behind him, he moved with quick, res resolute steps to his room. There he sat, busy with pen and paper for several minutes, and then, descending softly, found Okanagan in the store. Get your horse as quietly as you can, and ride into the railroad with this message, as if the devil was after you, he said. Okanagan stretched himself sleepily. Horton sending it up, sending, Horton's sending in at sunup. Yes, said Alton dryly. I want my message on the wire some hours before his, but nobody need know of it beyond you and me. Okanagan nodded, and in another five minutes, Alton looked into the room where Horton was still writing. I fancied I heard somebody riding down the trail, but it's not quite easy being a magistrate. My head's got kind of mixed, said the latter. Still, I've got... Still, I've nearly got this thing fixed, and if folks down in Vancouver don't fool over it, when Hallam hears what's happened to his partner, he'll be under lock and key. Oh, yes, said Alton. We'll hope for the best, though that man's kind of slippery. In the meanwhile, Tom of Okanagan was riding at a gallop down the trail, with the thin mists whirling by him and the stars above him growing dim, and there were several leagues between him and the settlement where daylight crept slowly into the valley. Thus, it happened that Horton's dispatches to the police at Vancouver were not the first that left the station, and that evening, Derringham, who was sitting with his daughter on the veranda of Foyle's, Foyle's house, turned from the girl with a little closing of his lips as he saw Hallam coming up the pathway. His movements suggested nervous haste, and though he was usually neat in dress, his unbuttoned coat had evidently been flung on while the glance he cast behind him towards the wharf where one of the sounder steamers was about to set was about to sail savored of apprehension this did not escape alice derringham miss ha mr hallam seems to be in a hurry she said i wish he had not come now because i do not like that man and you have not been well lately you will not let him disturb you derringham rose and looked down on her with a curious, curious little smile I don't know what it can be helped, but I am no more pleased to see Mr. Hallam than you seem to be, he said. For a moment, and though the breach between them had not been healed, the girl's heart smote her. Derringham had beguiled her into an action whose me memory would, she fancied, always retain its sting. But he, but he was her father, and seemed very worn and ill. Also, some instinctive impulse prompted her to detain him. Father, she said pleadingly, don't see him. Go in at once, and I will tell him that quietness is necessary to you. Derringham had almost yielded to the hand upon his arm when Hallam glanced in their direction and signed to him. Then he shook off the girl's grasp, and she shivered a little, for no apparent reason as they went in together. There was nobody else about, for Miss, Mrs. Forrell and her husband had gone down to the city, and she sat alone on the veranda while a murmur of voices reached her through an open window. Though his words were inaudible, her father appeared to be expostulating. Then he came out, and, as she noticed there was an unusual pallor in, in his face, and that his hands were trembling, she remembered that he looked as, as he did once before, when a partial failure of the heart's action had almost cost him his life. "'You must send Mrs. Mr. Hallam away at once,' she said. Derringham made a gesture of impatience. "'I shall be rid of him altogether in a few more minutes.' You have some money by you? Yes, said the girl. I'm not fond of going to the bank, and I got Mrs. Mr. Forrell to change my English check into currency. But why do you want it? Mr. Hallam, Hallam has to catch the steamer, and the banks are shut. Don't ask questions now, but get me the money quick. Alice Derringham went in, and returned with a little satchel. This is all I have. I don't feel very willing to lend it to Mr. Hallam, she said. Derringham took the satchel from her and moved away. Then, as though acting under impulse, he stopped and looked back at her. Thank you, my dear, he said with a curious gentleness. It has relieved me of a great deal, good deal of anxiety. He went away, and Alice Derringham, hearing the door close behind him, wondered a little 
When she next looked up, she saw Hallam swinging with a hasty strides toward down the road, and a little later the roar of whistles rang about the pine, pines as a big white steamer moved out into the inlet. A cloud of yellow vapor rolled from the, her funnel, and there was a frothing wash beneath her towering sides, and the girl watched her languidly until the pines which shrouded the narrows shut the great white fabric from her sight and left only a moving trail of smoke. Then she felt happier. The steamer had at least taken Hallam away, and her father was not now the courtly, though somewhat reserved gentleman who had treated her with indulgent kindness until Hallam crossed his path. It was a fine evening, and she saw, sat still, she sat still, she sat still on the veranda, wondering how the rift had imperceptibly widened between them, until again the blood crept to her forehead, as she remembered that it was his, at his instigation she had detained Alton. Still, though she realized that this could not be wholly forgotten, she took her part of the blame and felt sorry for the harassed man whose anxieties were intensified by his solicitude for her welfare. He was in difficulties, his health was failing, and she decided upon an attempt at reconciliation. The respect she had cherished for him could never be quite restored, but she could be a more sympathetic daughter and help him to bear his troubles. Then, as she glanced down across the inlet with eyes that grew softer, Forel and his wife came up through the garden. Still alone, he said. Where is your father? I think he is in your room, said the girl. Mr. Hallam came in to see him. Hallam? Now I wonder, said Forel st and stopped. But Alice Duringham had seen his face and being a woman took instinctive warning. I don't think he wanted anything of importance. He was only in, an, in a minute or two, she said. They went in together, but Forel was behind the girl when she pushed open a door and stopped just inside. Derringham was sitting before a table, and there was something, perplex something that perplexed her in his attitude. He seemed curiously still, and his head had fallen forward. Father, she said, and her heart beat a trifle faster, for Derringham did not move. His face was not visible. And, moving forward, she grew suddenly faint and cold as she touched his shoulder. There was no response from the man, and she now noticed that he seemed huddled together. But she saw nothing more, and for just then a hand was laid upon her arm. Shaking off the grasp, she turned and saw her growing horror reflected in Forrell's face. "'You must come away, my dear,' he said, he said hoarsely. Alice Derringham shivered, but she stood very straight a moment, staring down with dilated eyes at the grim figure in the chair. "'Touch him! Speak to him!' she said in a voice that set Nor Nor Forel's nerves on edge, and then, as the last faint hope died away, stretched out her hand with a little half-choked cry. "'Come away,' said Forel, very huskily. He was sensible for that the girl's hand was very cold as he drew her from the room, but he left her with his wife on the veranda and then went back hastily. Forrell was a kindly man, but he knew that speculation in Western minds has its underside, and it was for the girl's sake he stripped off the top sheets of the blotting paper, which had a recent impression on it, and afterwards poured the remaining contents of a wine glass out into the stove. Then he glanced all round the room before he went out to send for the doctor. It was an hour later when he found his wife alone. How is she? he said. Mrs. Forrell's eyes were hazy. I think she has given away at last. It was awful at first when she could only sit and look at me, she said. Then her voice sank a little. How did it happen, Tom? Heart disease, said Forrell. The doctor is quite sure of that. But, said Mrs. Forrell, what brought it on? Well, said Forrell slowly, anything that upsets one is apt to prove perilous in cases like his, and I rather fancy that Derringham had a quarrel with Hallam. They had dealings together, and I think Daring, Derringham must have lost a good deal of money. You will not, however, mention it to anyone. Miss, Mrs. Forrell looked at her husband curiously. No, of course, she said. I wish I knew what to do for the girl. That is end of chapter 32 of uh, Alton of Samasco, and uh, I guess I'll see if I read any more of it, but I figured I'd give you a little selection of it.
right near the end.